We're delighted to have you back for what happens to be our 242nd episode of Think Pickle Wise Human Human Architecture. And you are about to be our 12,942nd viewer. And we're reporting live again from our transcontinental transcultural triangle, however, a little reduced this time because you, DeSoto Brown, in your Bishop Museum. Hi, DeSoto. Hello, everyone. And me, who uh, we wished so for quite a while in the past, uh, viewing the things in Honolulu from a distance, which sometimes makes a lot of sense. Uh, but also, it makes sense to get up close and look. And that's what the two of us, DeSoto, are again, because I returned to Honolulu. And I'm reporting here from a recording and reporting from my BB, which don't be afraid if you watch our past shows. It's not one of these big bathrooms because luckily, or I should say, you know, fortunately, I can't afford one of these and never would I want to want one of these. But it's my bunkered bathroom in the Grand Hotel of Waikiki. And the reason why we can't uh, basically do the show from outside, which is my ongoing experiment of easy breeziness with a single layer glass jealousy so the sliding door open all the time is because we haven't converted Waikiki into what you suggested uh, the solo about two shows ago into a more walkable neighborhood. As of now, we have the distraction of leaf blowers, lawn mowers, uh, AC units on food delivery trucks, and you name more of them that would not allow you to listen to me. So. That's why we're in here. But to be transcontinental, we are only thanks to you, Ron Lindgren, back in your Long Beach, California. Hi, Ron. Hello, everyone. Good, good to have you back. And Ron, again, thanks all the time. The more we think about what we have to report on in these shows, we can't thank you enough for what you blessed us with uh, the most exotic tropical architecture. And I was just, we we're just chatting before the show that I did my, I, reconvene my early uh, routine uh, tour in your Halekalani, and you're greeted by all the ground staff, and uh, they're happy to hear from you, and we're happy that, again, uh, as we reported in a couple of shows, really not much significant change has happened. Even the bar that you were happy and you thought it's a great addition is now clad with some white tiles, pretty nondescript. So they're not really pretty much in your face. And I delivered your, your kind, generous opinion that you said, Ron, uh, that you should have added that bar wake back then. And now that they do, makes it makes it even better. So on, on these happy notes, unfortunately, we have to turn to some sadder stuff, very bad stuff. Uh, first slide up, please. Uh, because we don't want to forget that I just escaped the temperate and flee to our tropics here. And uh, not uh, very few people in the Ukraine have that chance. And the way uh, their homes look like is what even the star advertiser here on the left uh, pays attention to, where all their facade, all their threshold is blown out. And as we've been talking, this uh, spring has been dragging along and has been really cold. So that easy, breezy, tropical exotic that I can demonstrate here is not possible over there, unfortunately. And uh, on the right side, we see a couple of show quotes. Uh, once again, Ursula von der Leyen inherited one of the worst fossil formalist towers uh, by Kolb Himmelblau. And that tradition, as we were reporting on uh, some shows in the past here at the bottom left, is continued by colleagues Björke Ingels and, and Ben van Berkel. And I'm sort of ironically dismissing on what had been setting a, a signal uh, beacon-like in Frankfurt, which was Norman Foster's uh, tower, uh, the Commerce Tower, which uh, we just reminded ourselves by looking it up, um, is actually Korean now. Koreans bought it, and at least the initiation of the developments in our area here in the Alawana area is also a Korean developer. So, um, I thought immediately, well, then they should know if they're interested in buying a beacon of sustainable high-rise architecture, right? Maybe we should remind them of that. So they, they look up that, that knowledge again and apply it to these projects here. And lifting our spirits up a little bit, when you, Ron, had uh, 
notified us about a number of how many residential high rises are destroyed. What is that number again, Ron? Yeah, in the city of Kharkiv alone, they're counting up as many as 1,900 high rises, uh, not all flattened to the ground, but all made completely uninhabitable. Yeah, and that's obviously up, utmost tragic um, as it can be. And lifting the spirit up, is that Norman Foster again, the architect of that most sustainable, at least at its time, high rise that he blessed us with in Frankfurt, now uh, basically reaches out to a mayor uh, in the Ukraine and, and saying uh, when hopefully this uh, war will be over soon, um, I'm going to uh, promise to, to help rebuilding. And then obviously for you, you know, the historian uh, De Soto, um, you know, has two sides. Of course, you know, you want to bring back uh, the historic uh, legacy of, but then as you also uh, have always been looking and are looking to the future, you should also innovate that tradition. So obviously this is a great opportunity and Jay and I talking yesterday, it would be something to look up to. And if anything, and I think that's the way Foster also meant it, not saying he wasn't serious. I think he's probably dead serious, but also it gives us a chance to, again, to lift up our spirit and, you know, keep the fingers crossed for that happening uh, sooner uh, than later. But uh, things being yeah, demolished. And, you know, yeah. uh, and, and I can also add too, your home country of Germany went through this in World War II even more extensively than Ukraine has. And there was uh, exactly the same debate. How much do you rebuild? How much do you restore? What destroyed buildings do you replicate? And what new buildings do you build? So you, uh, Martin, have lived through this, have seen the yeah. end and tail end of that. So you know yeah. that is, those are the things you face. Yeah, I know it is. And, and, but to be fair and correct, right, um, we caused that misery to ourselves back then, and the Ukrainians have not, right? We don't want to leave Absolutely. that. Absolutely. That's right. That's right. But uh, tearing uh, buildings down, and actually decent buildings and good buildings, is unfortunately something we have to continue to report on. And on that note, let's go to the next slide, and you update us on that one, DeSoto. Well, this is actually a complex of two different buildings on Kapilani Boulevard, and that's what we're going to be focusing on is what's going on on the Kapilani Boulevard uh, strip, which is being extensively redeveloped right now. This is actually, as I said, two buildings. The lower building in the front facing Kapilani was a two-story uh, furniture sh showroom constructed for the C.S. Woe Company in 1958, but they always had the idea that they were going to add to that. And in 1965, that three or four story building behind it was constructed as well. But they're all together as one as one unit now. And this is yet another building that is probably going to be threatened or is threatened with demolition for yet another high rise in this area, which is growing up very quickly now. And obviously, we look towards what ha what are the good things on this older building? And not only is there sort of that interesting texture of those sort of shields, concrete shields that are across the tops of each one of those vertical windows, but they do probably do have some level of performance as well because they do provide some shade uh, at certain times of the year. And shading, as we will talk about, and as we have talked about a great deal, is very important here in the tropics. So just making a plain glass box is not to everybody's advantage. And if yeah. you can add things to cover up the sun, you're doing a good thing. Yeah, and I want to add the rain to that one. And they really remind me of what whoever created us has given us, which is eyebrows. And yep. we all know that when it rains, the rain gets redirected to the side and keeps our visibility, right? So they're pretty much like exactly eyebrows right. or lids, very cleverly yes, designed. Are. And as you see in the row up there, portrayed by Bundet Kanistakan in his exhibit about the uh, master Alfred Yi that Yuran had the privilege to have been working with, with your firm. He was, as Bundet reminds us, the uh, structural engineer on this project. And he was using something that um, great specific Rocky Mountain precast up to these days um, has the utmost skills in, which is prefab. 
because prefabrication is very efficient and effective. And especially these lids are prefab elements that got basically craned into the project. So something very innovative at its time and actually pretty innovative to these days as well, because pouring these high rises uh, in place is actually pretty ironic with the cost of labor you have on the island. This is the way in an efficient and effective way and using really the skills of very specific Rocky Mountain precast out there in Campbell Industrial Park. Uh, would be actually way more clever. But then again, DeSoto and Euron as well, we're, you know, progressive enough to say, okay, if something, and, you know, we have a couple of questions from our colleague, Mark, and Mark, thank you for all of these. We will address these uh, over the coming volumes of the show. They're primarily, you know, what are these developments about? Who's benefiting from them? What they're missing out on? And would there be alternatives and so while certainly um, I, I would upfront in saying we are basically trapped between two mountain ranges on the island. So we have a limit of land, a scarcity of land. So building high is pretty much the only or the main solution. So the problem is not that we build high, but the problem is how we build high. And that, that needs to be addressed in a more creative, creative way as we think. So um, how will this, so we're saying if something really good gets replaced, has to be replaced, maybe for density reason, because this is only four or five stories high, then maybe it needs to be replaced with something taller. But then of course, something that is even more innovative and that exceeds the high level of innovation that this building already had. And if and how that will be achieved gets us to the next slide. Are you like wowing and are super excited about this? Do I hear that? Well, uh, it, it does. It does harken now. Yet again, this is this purportedly is what's going to replace the buildings we just looked at, and it does have this kooky connection between the two towers. And it's not unlike the landmark building, which already is standing in Waikiki, as sort of at the entrance to Waikiki. But how innovative it is, uh, we will have to wait and see. And Ron, you certainly have been informing us about some buildings like this in Singapore that really do have innovative aspects to them. And that is picture four, Michael, if you can zoom on into that one. And that's uh, Safti Singapore, Ron. Tell us about it, please. Yeah, I was gonna say, uh, Kapiolani 1500, which is the sort of cryptic name for this, uh, uh, this project uh, is about 500 independent uh, residential condos. And I have to admit, it has a very lively uh, massing to it. And when you look closely, uh, there are, are some very serious attempts to go green, to bring gardens into the sky. Uh, in some cases near the ground, you see some very large wall surfaces around the plinth that are actually covered from top to bottom, side to side with live greenery. And there are ways to do such a thing and to, and to make that uh, be beautiful. And on, on certain lanai floors, there are actually pretty large scale trees shown uh, growing. And then there are two amenity decks, one on top of the plinth, which is uh, parking uh, above uh, retail at grade. But the one at the top, is at a 34th floor, and that's a sky deck with a very large pool um, and a lot of greenery. Yeah, I think you have to give a lot of credit to uh, this developer for putting together uh, a, pro a project that is very lively and massing. It does have balconies, at least. I, I'm not sure I can call any of them lanai's because of not having enough depth for furnishing, but the attempt to make things green uh, much, much to be applauded. Inter interestingly enough, as far as the market goes, 1,500 Kapiolani with its 500 condos, 60% of them are studios only. Mm -hmm. And to make this a discourse, um, again, appreciating your collegiality, Ron, and recognizing if there's something finally coming up that is more than just one plain box. But I will counter that and saying here's actually two plain boxes <laughs> that maybe the green in there isn't as essential, but more sort of effect uh, driven. Uh, yes, you have uh, one tree every what, six, seven floors. 
but that is not. Michael had intuitively uh, zoomed into number five. Can you do this again, please? Because this is a better example, and this is what this one might borrow from, uh, because this is by Woha, and Woha is that firm out of Singapore that prides itself to looking most into bioclimatic high rises. They're easy breezy. Um, there is some uh, criticism to that as one of the um, external consultants that Bundit brought into the currently ongoing um, a tropic hearing show where he was saying, well, they're mostly doing this in the common areas on the ground, but the units are still pretty much uh, conventionally uh, conditioned. But um, again, you see um, you see similar elements in here, but you can say Woha takes it to a more uh, substantial level. And also the number four, uh, uh, Ron, tell us a little bit about um, what um, DeSoto was pointing out to that this project reminds you of Masha Safdie's project in Singapore and share with us to what regard. Yeah, when you look at, uh, at Kapilani 1500, you will see that that sky deck is actually a bridge between the two towers. That's really uh, quite an interesting thing, but it's really just playing off of something that most Safdie has done uh, extremely well over the years, ever since uh, 1967, when he built the Habitat in, uh, in uh, Montreal, which was oh, three, 350 or so concrete boxes that ended up being 158 houses. Uh, but from there, uh, he, was, he found work in Singapore, and the, the one that we were looking, the slide we were looking at just before was something now called the, the Sky Habitat in Singapore. And it has, again, uh, this time there are two towers, and there are actually these bridges, three of them, that connect tower to tower. An interesting thing to do, uh, the top one at the roof at the 57th floor has a 100 meter long swimming pool as the bridge. But the two bridges below are actually meant to be communal spaces for the people living in the 500 or so condo apartments that are in this project. They actually are combination streets, terraces, and gardens in the sky. And the two towers step very interestingly and energetically. Uh, and every unit has a very large lanai, quote unquote, because they're, they're almost nine feet deep so that one could actually furnish them and use them as an outdoor room. Yeah. What doesn't show in the most softy schemes that really appeals to me is that these you know, full block and sometimes larger projects uh, can just be a, a block from getting from one place to the other. But Safdie wants his projects to be, uh, to be penetrated by sidewalks as continuations of city sidewalks. Uh, he wants the public, he wants to create a whole new sort of public uh, form. And he wants to make these buildings uh, not be so hermetic and looking in on themselves but welcoming and pulling people in from the city and enlivening the urban experience. Yeah, and, and using these multiple piece that you provided, you know, the, the perforated with publicity. Um, I also recall the term that you used previously, porosity. And to bring porosity, you said he, he doesn't, he is actually objecting the typology of high rise and he wants to keep the ground floor all open and porous. But he also does that if you guys look up, we provided the link here to that source of architectural digest. If you look at it, also the fenestrations have that aim. So the, the project almost, we're still on the number four uh, picture project, is trying to really dematerialize itself in its appearance, almost decomposition itself. And I think that's what the, uh, the new proposal isn't doing. It's doing the same old, we see too much glass, we see ga glass guardrails, which Safdie's project basically doesn't have. It has a combination of opaque ones that you can hide behind and find actual shade. And then there's open ones from the side. Um, and also, again, the greenery seems to be more decorative in here. And once again, it's certainly another 
exclusive project, we should also point out number five. This is uh, Safdie's first inaugural project. That's actually his thesis project that he built, and that's an encouragement for the emerging generation. Make such an awesome thesis project. Uh, you know, make your thesis project that awesome that it will be built. And that's the habitat building on the uh, expo. Yeah, that one in Montreal in 67, where uh, the multiple shows with Larry Medlin was doing the German pavilion together with Fry Otto. So anyways, there's way more substantial innovation, uh, which is what Safdi is known for as, and the names of the architects of this project here, we couldn't really retrieve to that regard, which is also quite sad. And again, going back to Soda to the landmark building, we're also uh, challenged and charged to maybe write uh, one of the first architectural guides about our city um, that has been there in a while. So I, you know, I'm not saying it won't, but I'm kind of questioning if that building might make it in there, although it has this very catchy gesture, right, of, yep. of that hole yep. in the middle and that bridge up there. But at least there's some function above that in that bridge. And here it's just a gentrified poolscape for the very rich people. And is that really, do we really need more of that? Uh, that's to be further debated in this show and in many more shows, obviously, to come. And we, no surprise, are questioning that. So um, let's go next door to uh, this building. Uh, Eva's side of this new proposal is next slide. Yeah, this slide is what we see here. And this might be seen as the sort of initiation or the nucleus of that new development in this area because there's two buildings and one is the one on the left, the Walgreens building, and that brings back memories uh, to Solo, right? Lots of. <laughs> well, yeah, we had a lot of debate when this was created. And uh, as you pointed out, I have told me, this is an architect from Germany who came up with this. And this was a concept that Walgreens at the time, which is a national drugstore chain, was trying out, which is kind of a super Walgreens, two-story with a lot of other amenities to it. And it has this very distinctive sort of fractured facade. Uh, the architect claimed to have been inspired by Hawaiian fishing nets, which I don't quite see, but there it is. And unfortunately, this shut down because it didn't get enough uh, foot traffic. So it sits empty now. It was intentionally constructed with a parking building attached, which is strong enough and reinforced enough to be able to support a high rise built on top of it. So this could still become another high rise built on part of the lot where this Walgreens, former Walgreens was. This also, as you just said, is this intersection of Keiamoku Street and Kapiolani Boulevard is really the focus or the nucleus of what's going on right now with the construction of multiple high rises inspired by the planned expansion of the Honolulu train system to terminate at Ala Moana Center, although at the moment that is up in the air. And if it does come to happen, it probably will not be in place and functioning till at least 2031. That's quite some time from now. However, we still are seeing a bunch of high rises. And one of those, the one that's right in the center here, which is one of the early blue glass buildings, which of which there are an abundance and more are going to be built. It's actually part of Ala Moana Center. It was constructed at the same time as the rest of this retail part was facing onto Kapiolani. And it really does not fulfill what we hope buildings will. First of all, it is oriented in the incorrect direction so that it is interrupting the flow of the trade winds. And secondly, it's just a plain blue glass box. It has no openings, it has no lanai's, it will get hot in the full sun and it requires a good deal of fossil fuel to air condition it all the time so that it remains livable. And just beyond that is another one of the early high rises as part of this new batch. And it does have lanai's, although you don't see them here. And again, however, it does face in the wrong direction. Its axis is not fulfilling what we would prefer would happen with these high rises. Yeah, and, and talking your cultural heritage in the Sola and us kooky Germans, Bettina Maynard, who is the one who is a principal and now an, an architect to Y, who was once at our school doing this pitch of uh, having the Walgreens being inspired by, by your culture. 
I think it's something that um, your culture didn't have, which is a microwave or refrigerator. And the, the terms of like, these are American terms that I'm actually believing in because we always go back over the summers and the breaks to look at my work and how it's holding up over time. And Americans, these terms don't exist in German. So listen, this is uh, your evidence-based design, EBD, your post-occupancy evaluation, POE of your LCA life cycle assessment. And this building probably gets the worst ratings because you took all this energy, all this fossil energy of all these materials uh, involved, built something that is uh, orientation and fenestration wise wrong. And then the most lag of sustainability uh, as this word that summarizes is all is to keep it as long as you can because you put all this uh, fossil energy in it. And this was only a couple of years before it was closed down. So one would even think was that intentional, right? Just to make a placeholder, but it's way too much of an expense for, for a placeholder. And uh, before we have to close uh, very soon, uh, again, another story to that one Alamoana to the right that you explained to us. When I um, just came and familiarized yourself, uh, myself with what is actually the innovative nucleus of this area is our favorite Alamoana building, and I uh, heard that the guy in charge of development is not just a colleague of mine as an architect, but also a fellow European uh, uh, who was uh, in charge at General Growth Properties, who sold it now. I did a pitch presentation to him, and he basically said, oh, well, I didn't know I have such a beauty, meaning the Alamana building. And I said, well, now that you know, whatever you do, you do with knowing. And secondly, he said, uh, look down and he said, well, given all that, you probably might not like what we have just been completing, which is one Alamoana. And I said, yes, sir, that is the case. <laughs> so anyways, yeah, and we have the Kapilani residences is the first inaugural of that new boom there. But these two buildings might have started that in a tragic way. And uh, the story is not over because there is, uh, as of now, I think we can say, unfortunately, more to come along these lines, but we have to save that for next time, for next week. So hope to see you again for that one. And until then, please stay uh, inclusively um, uh, tropical and tropical ex inclusive, not exclusive, because these are all exclusive. That's in my mind when I'm trying to say goodbye to you, right? All these projects are not for the increasing uh, needs. When I will leave this suffocating bathroom now, I will catch the breath and breath again and be on my lanai. And I see the people down in the park that we need to provide for and, and not the rich ones. We have enough rich people on the island. So with that, see you again next week. Bye guys. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.